What's the worst day in the history of your country? As an American, I the first thing that came to my mind would be okay, September 11th, 2001. Obviously, terrible tragedy. Over 3,000 American lives lost. Okay, other choices might have been Pearl Harbor, the Battle of Antietam, 20,000 soldiers, all American, ended up dead. Okay, after that particular battle, you might have said the war, you know, gone all the way back to the War of 1812. Okay, when the British literally marched on Washington, D.C. and burned down the White House, burned down the symbol of American pride. And of course, it's stupid to argue which day was worse or, you know, which situation led to worse results. Obviously, the human cost was terrible and the effects of all of those events are still felt and uh, it's stupid to say which one is worse. But if you were a British person and you answered that question, 95% of the time you would say one particular day. Now, on this particular day, the British suffered 57,470 casualties. Of those casualties, 19,270 died. And people, that was on the first day of this particular battle. Things would only get worse from there, and this battle would erupt into one of the worst tragedies in the history of the world. And not only probably one of the top three worst battles of all time, but certainly one of the top three, top five, top ten worst events in the history of the world. Okay, when you read the accounts, when you look at what actually happened, look at why it happened, there's nothing happy about it. So what was the worst day in the history of Britain as a country? It was the first day of the Battle of the Somme. So in order to understand where we're at with the Battle of the Somme, okay, obviously this is taking place during World War I, and we do need a little bit of context about what's going on beforehand before we get into the battle. So obviously World War One kicks off in 1914. I'm not going to go into the causes of the war or why it started or kind of the initial aspects of the war. I certainly recommend you go look that up. Okay, go listen to another podcast. Go read a book. Go listen to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, which if you haven't done, you should probably do that you know, as soon as possible. So what we basically have is the Germans are fighting a war on two fronts. Okay, so they have to deal with the Russians on their eastern front, and they have to deal with mainly the French on their western front. Now, this is during 1914. It actually takes a while for the British to get involved in the war. Okay, so the French are taking the brunt of this German offensive for much of 1914 into 1915. And then slowly the British start bringing in their land forces, they start assembling their army, and they start getting ready to help the French on the Western Front. Now, this goes on for most of 1915, and then by 1916, the British are ready to kind of really go through their big offensive and try and help the French by putting a lot of pressure on Germany. So... The British commanders and the French commanders, they get together and they plan out this big offensive where the French are going to attack, the British are going to attack together, and hopefully they'll achieve a breakthrough in the German lines. They'll be able to get behind their defenses and kind of wreak havoc that way. Okay, so the plan for the Somme initially was, it was originally planned to be a French offensive. Now the British were going to provide assistance and this would allow them even more time to get ready and get up to speed on kind of how this war was fought and the way things were working. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. The Germans, in earlier in 1916, launched an attack at a place called Verdun. Okay, and Verdun is one of the worst battles uh, right up there with the Somme. 
In fact, we may do another episode at some point on Verdun. And basically the French were getting hammered so hard that they were unable to spearhead this offensive that they had been planning with the British. So now this leaves the British in a position where they either have two choices. They can not honor their alliance with France, or they can take some pressure off of the French at Verdun by launching an offensive mostly of their own okay, with a small amount of French assistance. And this offensive that they're going to launch is the Battle of the Somme. So here's General Douglas Haig, and he's in command of the British forces. Here's what he has to say on why the British were attacking at the Somme, basically what the strategic objectives were. So, quote, My policy is briefly to, one, train my divisions and to collect as much ammunition and as many guns as possible. Two, to make arrangements to support the French, attacking in order to draw off pressure from Verdun when the French consider the military situation demands it. And three, but while attacking to help our allies, not to think that we can for a certainty destroy the power of Germany this year. So in our attacks, we must also aim at improving our positions with the view to make sure the results of the campaign next year, end quote. So General Haig really had no major strategic objectives. Okay, again, this, this battle at the Somme was mostly just a, an offensive the British were going to launch in order to take pressure off the French. Okay, this is called alliance warfare. The British ally, France, was in dire need, and the British needed to basically come up with an offensive in order to take off some of the pressure from the French that they were feeling after done. Now, the basic reality of the war at this point was something called trench warfare. So the way it worked was that both sides kind of dug into the ground in order to protect themselves from the flying machine guns, the bombing, the artillery, and, you know, all the other crazy concoctions that the other army had prepared for them. Okay, so the only way to protect yourselves at this time from those machine guns, those artillery bombs, was to dig into the earth. So what you would have would once you know would be one side digging into the ground on a piece of land that they felt they could defend, and you had another side, maybe a hundred yards on the other side of that, maybe a mile on the other side of that, maybe even more, dug in and ready to defend themselves. And the area in between was what is known as no man's land. Okay, so in order to attack the other trench, you usually softened it up with artillery fire. And while that, you know, that particular army was wor- worried about uh, being hit with artillery, you went over the top into no man's land and then you tried to attack the t- trench, took the trench, and then defended it as your own. And kind of inch by inch, literally yard by yard, you would take the opponent's territory. So that was kind of the way the battle was working. Now, as for the Psalm, here's how the offensive was. Uh, basically planned out. Okay, the British, their plan was just unleash a barrage of artillery that basically the world had never seen before. So they were going to launch so many bombs, so many artillery shells, so many shrapnel shells, so many explosive shells into these German defenses that the idea was it would just be easy pickings for the army to go kind of march in and sweep off the rest of it. So here's a British officer Uh, telling his troops what they should expect after this huge bombing barrage. Quote, When you get to the village that is the first day's objective, you will find the Germans all dead. Not even a rat will have survived. End quote. So as you see, the uh, primary kind of attitude of these British officers and soldiers and generals was that this huge artillery barrage was going to wipe out the Germans in one fell swoop, and then as we go attack, it'll be kind of an easier time than it has been for us recently because the Germans will all be dead at this point. Now, unfortunately for the British, what they didn't realize was that the Germans had constructed some incredible defensive trenches here. Okay, so we're talking up to 30 yards of barbed wire, okay, thick, heavy, sharp barbed wire in front of the trench. Okay, and this means that in order to even think about attacking the trench, you have to break up all that barbed wire. You have to launch artillery at it, and if that artillery doesn't break up that barbed wire, when you go to attack, you're going to get stuck. Okay, And as you're stuck, machine guns are firing at you, rifles are firing at you, and guess what? You're dead. All right, so we had all that barbed wire in those German trenches. 
Some of these trenches were dug so deep, and there was underground tunnels connecting the trenches, and there was lines of trenches, so it wasn't just one trench, and then, you know, that's it. There was one trench, and then maybe 100 yards later, another trench, then another trench. Okay, this was a whole sector of defenses. Okay, one historian called it and basically an underground city. Okay, and a human beehive of interaction, communication, defense trenches, and what the Germans actually started to do towards the um, beginning of the Battle of Somme was they reinforced a lot of these trenches with concrete. Okay, so the artillery shell would not damage the trench, it would not go as deep, and the concrete would actually help in the defense. So these German trenches were incredibly well structured, incredibly ready for the huge barrage that the British were going to fire upon them. And one other thing to note before the bullets and the shells start flying in this battle is the role of aircraft. So World War I is often seen as the first modern war, and the reason for that is that okay, not only do you have new technology like machine guns and submarines and tanks and aircraft playing a huge role, uh, but you also have this idea that not only is just the soldiers at the battlefield fighting, but the whole society is fighting this war together. Okay, whether that be in the trenches, at the home front, producing materials, producing new, um, you know, technologies. This is a modern war. Everyone's contributing. Okay, and the goal is to kind of break the other society. And the, the best way to do that, in a lot of cases, was to inflict pain and punishment on the battlefield. But in this particular case, we're talking about the production of aircraft. And aircraft played a huge role in these battles. So it wasn't kind of like air warfare like you might think of it today with planes shooting and dodging at each other, although that did happen a little bit. Uh, what these planes were mostly used for, at least during this time period in the war, was as reconnaissance. Okay, so the planes would fly over the enemy trenches, they would take pictures, and then those pictures could be used by the generals and the commanders to plot where they were going to fire their artillery strikes. Okay, where are they? Where are their defense is strong? Where are their defense is weak? Where can we capitalize? So these aircraft were used primarily by the British during this time in order to improve their artillery, and that's why they had such a big advantage, at least in this battle, from an artillery perspective. Now, the Germans would eventually even the odds in the air, and we'll get there. But at the beginning of the battle, big advantage for the British in the air. Now, in late June of 1916... We're going to get this battle kicked off with that momentous British artillery barrage that we talked about. So here's a British captain talking about what he saw and what he felt as this artillery barrage was going underway. Quote, Armageddon started today and we are right in the thick of it. There is now such a row going on I absolutely can't hear myself think. Day and night and all day and all night, guns and nothing but guns, and the shattering clang of bursting high explosives. This is the great offensive, the long-looked-for big push, and the whole course of the war will be settled in the next 10 days, some time to be living in. I get a wonderful view from my observing station and in front of me and right and left. As far as I can see, there is nothing but bursting shells. It's a weird sight, not a living soul or beast, but countless puffs of smoke from the white fleecy ball of the field gun shrapnel to the dense greasy pull of the hard, heavy howitzer. It's quite funny to think that in London life is going on just as usual and no one even knows this show has started. Well, out, out here at least seven different kinds of hell are rampant. End quote. So what we see is that this artillery barrage is significant and even the soldiers who have been living in these trenches for who knows how long at this point are starting to say, hey, this is a serious, significant barrage. Now, on the flip side of this, we have the Germans. So what does it feel like to be a German in the trenches, basically getting pounded with this unprecedented artillery barrage? Here's a German soldier talking about his experience at the Somme. Quote, Shall I live till morning? Haven't we had enough of this frightful horror? Five days and five nights now this hell concert has lasted. One's head is like a madman's. The tongue sticks to the roof of the mouth. Almost nothing to eat and nothing to drink, no sleep, all contact with the outer world cut off, no sign of life from home, nor can we send any news to our loved ones. What anxiety they must feel about us. How long is this going to last? End quote. So what you see here is uh, 
the effect that these artillery barrages would have on the soldiers. Okay, it would create depression, fear. Okay, it was a constant barrage. You never knew uh, basically when your life was going to end. So bombs were coming in 24-7, and people around you were dying. It's muddy, it's rainy, you're living in a trench, and your friends are dying around you. It's not the best scenario for psychological health, obviously. Now, while this is happening, the Germans are, uh, you know, they're taking the brunt of the barrage, but all in all, they're sitting there, and their defenses are well prepared, so they are losing a lot of men, but uh, by and large, from World War I standards, this isn't going to be the most effective artillery barrage, and the Germans are sitting there stewing and kind of getting ready for their revenge, which they're going to get. Okay, and this is going to happen on July 1st, 1916, the official start of the battle, when the British go over the top. So after several days and several nights of one of the biggest artillery barrages in all of World War I, and therefore the history of the world, the British are finally ready to attack. So in the early morning hours of July 1st, 1916, they order everyone over the top. Here's a British account of what happened on that day from Lieutenant William Coiler. Quote, The enemy artillery and machine guns are terrific. The anticipation of being hit has become so agonizing that I can scarcely bear it. I almost wish to God I could be hit and have it done with. I've lost some of my men. I feel an overwhelming desire to swear, to blaspheme, to shout out the wickedest oaths I can think of. But I am much too inarticulate to do anything of the kind. A shell bursts near and I feel the hot blast. It seems to me this is a ghastly failure already. A trench runs diagonally across our path. Half of my remaining men are already in it. My whole being cries out in protest against this ordeal. I'm streaming with perspiration. I think I shall go mad. I am in the trench trying to collect the rest of the men together. Where the devil have they all got to? End quote. So what you see in this quote is the, uh, basically the craziness of fighting a battle in World War I. So what ended up happening was the British artillery barrage was not as, as effective as they planned. So what you had was German defenses that were still intact, barbed wire that was still there, artillery guns that were still there, and when the British went over the top into no man's land, they were basically sitting ducks, and they basically just got mowed down. This was a disaster for the British. I mean, the, the British were so confident in their artillery barrage that they told their officers to have their soldiers march across no man's land, basically in formations, in a line. And they were moving slowly across no man's land in a line, basically at a light jog okay, towards the enemy trenches, because in large part, they thought that the Germans were going to be wiped out by that huge barrage. Obviously, this would be a total disaster. Later on in the war, people would figure out you don't go across no man's land in a, in a line. You go across in small groups. You dart from place to place, and you kind of take a more guerrilla aspect, guerrilla style to it. Okay, so here's what the Germans experienced as they kind of saw this British attack coming from across no man's land. Quote, We were surprised to see them walking. We had never seen that before. When we started to fire, we just had to load and reload. They went down in their hundreds. We didn't even have to aim. We just fired into them. End quote. Okay, we didn't have to aim. That's insane. The, the British were coming in such numbers and so slowly and so kind of disorganized that the Germans basically just wiped them out easily. Things were so terrible in this battle for the British that there's some stories of the machine guns that the Germans were using to shoot the British. They were firing in such numbers and in such incredibly high rounds that basically the water coolant inside the machine guns, the, you know, the, the cooling mechanism that allows the machine gun to keep firing was being overheated, and the, the Germans were running out of water because they hadn't anticipated uh, using those guns this much, so they had to basically use urine as a water cooler. Okay, so... That's how insane this battle was and how little either side was prepared 
for what was actually happening. The carnage was so total and so tremendous. There's one story that I don't think I've ever seen before in, in a lot of these battles I've looked at, but here's G.J. Meyer, historian on the First World War, talking about one of these stories. So, quote, Before it was over, the German gunners, at points in the center where the carnage had been most terrible, found themselves unwilling to continue firing. Shutting down their guns, they watched in silence as the British departed with whatever wounded they were able to take with them. End quote. So the Germans literally stopped firing. And they kind of took pity on the British and just let them collect their wounded, let them collect their dead, and just go back to their trench. So if that doesn't show kind of just the sadness of this whole battle and the carnage that the British uh, inflicted, upon themselves largely, then I don't know what does. Now, I don't get the impression that the British were just stupid and just, you know, going over the top with no support and just, you know, slowly walking in a line and there was no strategy at all. Okay, there, there were different strategies used, okay? The British used uh, what's known as a creeping barrage in certain places where you basically have a artillery group bomb the area directly in front of you and as they're bombing and moving it forward you slowly follow them and therefore it should allow you good cover to get across no man's land and then start getting into enemy trenches. Okay, the problem with the creeping barrage was that the artillery was not always accurate. Okay, sometimes they would go too far and then all of a sudden you have people shooting at you easily. Sometimes it would go too short and you'd have your own men getting killed by the artillery. Okay, so the artillery was largely inaccurate. The creeping barrage was something that was slowly perfected over the course of the war but the ones on the first day of the Battle of the Somme were not effective. You also had examples of gas attacks. Okay, You had people tunneling under German trenches, trying to uh, ignite mines and basically collapse trenches that way. So the British used a lot of different uh, strategies, but at the end of the day, none were particularly effective. Now, there are certain stories of the British being quote-unquote fortified with rum as they were attacking. So a lot of officers used alcohol as a way to encourage uh, the, the soldiers to actually take part in the battle. Okay. So again, we see try, kind of the, the tragedy and, and the, uh, the sadness of World War I uh, in ways that you might not expect. The final results of that terrible first day for the British, as we said earlier, 57,470 casualties. Okay, 19,240 of those are going to be deaths, and that's all for the British in one day. Uh, it's the worst day in the history of British warfare, probably the worst day in the history of Britain as a country, um, and certainly one of the worst days in the history of warfare, period. It's, it's tough to think of any battles that uh, one side got inflicted that many casualties. Uh, you might go back to ancient Rome, maybe... Uh, ancient Greece, but that's a that's a sad day. That's a tough day for the British. 8,000 Germans would die on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Not nearly as many, but still a significant amount. And folks, we're only just getting started here. This is going to go on for months. Okay, the Battle of the Somme was not just one day. It lasted for months, and it was a terrible tragedy, which we're going to get into. So now that we know what the first day of the battle looked like and what you know the first couple attacks probably looked like and what it felt to be at the Somme, what's going to end up happening in this, this battle is that things are going to get more brutal, both sides are going to dig in, and they're really going to start fighting even more viciously, and uh, this situation is going to basically prolong itself over the course of the next three months. Okay, so here's a German general talking to his subordinates telling them what they need to be telling their officers about how they're supposed to fight in this battle. Quote, The large areas of ground that we have lost in certain places will be attacked and wrested back from the enemy, just as soon as the reinforcements which are on the way arrive. For the time being, we must hold our current positions without fail and improve on them by means of minor counterattacks. I forbid the voluntary relinquishment of positions. Every commander is responsible for making each man in the army aware about this determination to fight it out. The enemy must be made to pick his way over forward over our corpses. End quote. So 
what you see in that quote is that the Germans, okay, they took some losses as far as territory on that first day of the battle and that first couple attacks by the British and the French, and they were determined to wrestle back that ground no matter what it took. Okay, so what we see is the British and French launching attacks, and then we also see the Germans launching counterattacks trying to get back that territory. So uh, literally they're fighting and dying over every single inch of the battlefield. Now this war of attrition was really starting to take its toll both psychologically and physically on the soldiers at the battle. Here's a Australian uh, soldier who finds himself stuck in no man's land, basically trying to avoid gunfire uh, during the Battle of the Somme. Quote, As we lay out among the poppies in no man's land, we could see the bullets cutting off the poppies almost against our heads. The flashes of the guns, the bursting of the shells, and the very lights made the night like day, and as I lay flat to the ground as possible, I was expecting to stop one at any time. Jamming my tin helmet down on my head, I brought the body of my rifle across my face to stop anything that might happen to drop low. In the tumult, it was impossible to hear orders. My ears were ringing with the cracking of bullets. A man alongside me was crying like a baby, and although I tried to reassure him, he kept on saying we would never get out of it. Suddenly, I saw men scrambling to their feet. Taking this to be the signal for the charge, I jumped up and dashed across. End quote. So you see the, the chaotic nature of this fighting with people crying and people despairing and shells going off and gunfire and people laying on the ground trying to get you know as close to the ground as possible to avoid just you know what's apparently just gunfire going between the two trench lines in a chaotic and random fashion and here's a german account of what life was like living through this battle as the days wore on as the weeks wore on as the months wore on quote Because there were no dugouts, we sheltered in shell holes. With the help of a mate, I dug mine down a bit deeper. Lying flat out, we carefully lifted thistles and other shrubby weeds, which we planted around the rim of our shell hole to give us cover from view. We lay in this hole for three and a half hours, unable because of the heavy fire to be moved or relieved. Frequently, we also sheltered in foxholes with our legs drawn up, or we would scramble our way from shell hole to shell hole, linking them together. The water was green and full of muddy clay, but we had to use it to brew coffee because the ration parties could not get through to us. We were always short of bread. On one occasion, the section was able to share a bottle of wine. Once came the shout, Tommy is attacking. We waited in peaceful impatience and looked forward to giving him a warm reception, but not a single Tommy appeared. What a shame. What a bloody shame. End quote. So you see kind of the two elements here that One is that these soldiers were in terrible conditions, okay, drinking muddy water, basically living in muddy water, and obviously it was taking a psychological toll on them, but you see from both perspectives, the Germans and uh, the British forces and the French forces, you see a desire to continue fighting and a, a courageousness that even though these conditions are bad, and for example, in that uh, German quote, that particular soldier was looking forward to, you know, battle so that they could finally get this over with. So a lot of these soldiers were kind of waiting for that one big blow where one side would go and and make the final assault and they wouldn't have to do this anymore. After about two months of this kind of horrible war of attrition, what we see is that the British had, quote unquote, broken into the German defense system, but they hadn't broken through it. Okay, so... Remember, General Haig, leader of the British forces, wanted to get that huge breakthrough so he could get behind the enemy lines and cause havoc. He had kind of broken into the defenses, but they were never able to break through. And what we see is that constant attack, counterattack, attack, counterattack, warfare style. Now, this goes on for all of July, all of August. By the end of August, the German General Falkenhayn gets sacked, basically, and he's replaced by two guys named Ludendorff and Hindenburg, and they're going to take over this this war effort. And what we start to see is that no one had really expected this battle to go this long, and the casualties are starting to rack up. People are starting to ask, what the heck are we doing fighting this fight? On the one hand, on the other hand, other people are saying, hey, we've spent so many lives here, we can't just, you know, abandon the plan, and we got to stick it out, and we got to win this battle. So both sides were digging in during the months of July and August. 
So finally, September rolls around, and what we're going to see is the last great offensive of this Battle of the Somme. So what ends up happening is that the British are going to plan out one final kind of body blow to try and end this battle and, and gain a victory. And one of the key things that's actually going to contribute to this this offensive is something called the tank. I think oftentimes people from the modern day take the take the tank for granted as just a you know a, a staple of warfare, but World War One was actually the first time we saw the tank. So originally the tank was designed as something that could cross from one trench to the other and destroy some of the defenses in the other trench. It was basically a mechanized weapon that could cross over no man's land without getting gunned down by machine gun fire. This function used to be served by cavalry, basically, who could charge across the battlefield, but obviously in this trench warfare scenario, those cavalry are going to get shot down pretty easily. But if we have a machine that can move pretty quickly and is covered in armor and can fire back, now all of a sudden we have another weapon. Now the original tanks were not as obviously as advanced as tanks are today. These things were slow. A lot of them were breaking down in the middle of the battle. Not all of them had significant firepower. So the tank was often seen as a supporting weapon where the infantry could basically hide behind the tank and advance behind the tank as it was moving. And then once the tank was able to clear out some key machine gun positions, then this would assist the infantry to charge across no man's land. And it was seen that the tank could provide some offensive capabilities as well, but that didn't come until later in the war. And then obviously the technology improved over the course of the next few years. And then obviously tanks play a huge role in World War II. And of course, the thing you have to remember is that these soldiers in the trenches during World War One had never seen anything like a tank before. And honestly, it's hard to imagine what you might be feeling and what you might be thinking as you see you know, this giant machine crawling across no man's land, shooting people and blowing stuff up. So here's a quote from one of the German sergeants who sees this tank for the first time. Quote, A man came running in from the left, shouting, There is a crocodile crawling into our lines. The poor wretch was off his head. He had seen a tank for the first time and had imagined this giant of a machine, rearing up and dipping down as it came to be a monster. It presented a fantastic picture, this colossus in the dawn light. One moment its front section would disappear into a crater, with the rear section still protruding, the next, its yawning mouth would rear up out of the crater to s- roll slowly forward with terrifying assurance. End quote. So, obviously, this tank was freaking people out, and it was, was doing some damage on the battlefield. Now, during this big offensive that we're in the midst of, the tank's going to be used. Only about 30 of them are actually going to make it to the battlefield due to problems with development, problems with manufacturing. And of those 30 tanks, a lot of them ended up just breaking down on the battlefield. A lot of them proved easy targets for artillery because of kind of the limitations that we talked about earlier. And unfortunately for those infantry units that were with the tank, you know, how would you feel if you were basically being tested by, you know, the higher ups? Okay. They didn't know if this tank was going to be effective or not. They just rolled it out there and some of them worked, some of them didn't. So how would you feel to be a soldier in one of those groups where the tank broke down or was easy fodder for our artillery? So uh, that can't have been a good feeling for the soldiers on the battlefield. In addition to tanks, the British were obviously still using their aircraft. They were still using their artillery. And there was this kind of back and forth uh, with using the creeping barrage, using shrapnel barrages, using different techniques to try and get through the German defenses. So this final British assault was actually a combination of a whole lot of different styles of attack, whether it be gas attack, the creeping barrage, using the tank, maybe mixing all of those together. So the British were not just simply throwing wave after wave. They were trying to innovate and trying to find ways to break the defenses, but ultimately it was not effective. So the British were using all these strategies to try and bite and hold as much of the German line as possible. 
hoping for that big breakthrough. Now, once September kind of comes and goes, this big assault didn't really get the results the British were looking for. We start getting what's known as the rainy season. So it starts raining a lot more. This creates muddy conditions. This creates um, just horrible conditions on the battlefield, obviously, for the people who have to live there. It ruins morale, and it actually causes the aircraft to be unable to effectively use reconnaissance in order to, you know, scout the enemy trenches. So what we start seeing is that the artillery fire is less and less accurate and combine that with the horrible conditions in the trenches and you have just kind of a random chaotic mess. And by the end, you know, the beginning of November 1916, the Somme had basically become hell itself. And it's been my intention with this episode to try and communicate how crappy the conditions were at the Somme. So I hope that throughout the episode, looking at the accounts and the descriptions of those primary accounts, that you get a good understanding of just how crappy it was to be in this situation. And there was one quote that I really wanted to use to kind of drive this home. It comes from a Canadian soldier who stumbles upon a German trench after one of these bombing attacks, and he kind of describes what he sees in the trench and it's it's kind of horrifying and it's it's even more ghastly than usual and now that I've kind of reached this point in in the podcast I'm not going to quote it because I I don't want to you know I do want to communicate that uh, that kind of hopeless feeling and that sadness and that uh, just horrible tragedy element of of the conditions on the ground at the Somme but I think in large part I've I've done that hopefully and and this particular account is pretty gruesome, but I will say this. So this Canadian soldier uh, gets to the trenches, and, and it was a normal battlefield occurrence to, I don't want to say loot the dead, but if you came across a group of soldiers who were deceased, you might take their weapons, you might take their equipment, okay, wristwatches, canteens, anything that might be useful for the war effort. So this is, you know, total war after all, and you need to do whatever you can in order to uh, make the best of a bad situation. So, But in this particular account that I'm talking about, uh, things are so ghastly and so terrible that the Canadian soldier doesn't even loot the uh, loot the bodies, and they just kind of move on because um, things are so ghastly. So here's the, here's the end of that quote. It says, quote, We did not collect many souvenirs, for our own skin was the best souvenir we could think of that day. End quote. So conditions were so bad in that particular section of the battlefield that they just left the dead where they were and they just didn't want to deal with it. And it kind of symbolizes how bad things got. So the weather was getting crappy. Conditions were obviously terrible on the field of battle. It was rainy. Bullets were flying everywhere. Both sides were taking tremendous losses. And we were starting to get into the winter months. Now, for the most part, neither side wanted to fight during the winter for a variety of reasons. Um, So basically what happens is the British launch one more kind of minor bite and hold attack. This one's actually effective. They use a, a good combination of the creeping barrage, tanks, different other techniques. And they bite off a chunk of territory. And that's what they want to hold for the rest of the winter. So... There are some small, you know, line straightening skirmishes, they call them, uh, where both sides kind of cement where their lines are going to be, where the trenches are going to be. But for the most part, by the end of November, the Battle of the Somme is officially over, and both sides are ready to basically cease any major offensives for the rest of the winter. So at the end of the day, we had the Battle of the Somme, which officially kicked off on July 1st, 1916 went into mid-November, okay, that's about four and a half months, maybe five months if you count uh, the line straightening activities and the barrages that were happening before July 1st, so we had about five months of just chaos and destruction. The total losses for the British, we have 419,654 casualties, 131,000 of those who are deaths. For the French, we had 204 
1,253 casualties. And for the Germans, no one's really sure. We have a number anywhere between 450,000 and 600,000 uh, is the official number that most historians use. So, And those are casualties. So it's kind of incredible when you have basically a margin of error of 150,000 people. It's it's really unthinkable, the sheer scale of the destruction and the amount of devastation that occurred during this battle. Other than the casualties and just the destruction, what is the lesson that kind of the commanders or the people fighting the war learned during the Somme? Well, in my opinion, that that's tough to say. So I think we with the Somme and with Verdun before that and with actually Verdun going on during that and uh, with some of these other major World War One battles, what we see is that there's a shift from trying to grab territory and control strategic ground and, you know, fight in a traditional style, you know, taking the strategic objectives and defending, you know, territory that's important. And what we see is that there's a shift in the the style of warfare from that to a more modern style of basically how many men can we kill before this society completely collapses. So at Verdun and at the Somme, it wasn't just a matter of who can grab the most territory and control it. It's really a matter of who can destroy the most lives and cause the most destruction and create the most havoc in the hopes that that will create a ripple effect and basically collapse the whole society. So what we start seeing is a approach where human lives become less and less valuable and they're kind of used as a means to an end. And if that's not a symbol of World War I being a modern war, then I don't know what is. So to wrap things up and kind of conclude with this episode, I really did want this episode to be more about kind of the human element of the battle at the Somme and kind of what it felt to be like in the battle and how these soldiers were able to get through it and do what they ultimately did while also giving a basic overview of the Somme. So just to hammer that kind of human emotion home, I'm going to close out with a letter that a British soldier wrote to his wife back home before that initial charge on July 1st at the at the Battle of the Somme. And this quote comes from Peter Hart's book, The Great War. And he's able to find this letter home from a Captain Charles May to his wife. And this letter really just kind of summarizes the whole Battle of the Somme. And honestly, it really summarizes World War I in general, and maybe even warfare in general. So remember, he's writing this home to his wife before that disastrous British assault on July 1st, 1916, to kick off the Battle of the Somme. Quote, I must not allow myself to dwell on the personal. There is no room for it here. Also, it is demoralizing. But I do not want to die. Not that I mind for myself. If it be that I am to go, I am ready. But the thought that I may never see you again, or our darling baby, turns my bowels to water. I cannot think of it even with the semblance of equanimity. My one consolation is the happiness that has been ours. Also, my conscience is clear that I have always tried to make life a joy to you. I know at least that if I go, you will not want. That is something. But it it is the thought that we may be cut off from one another, which is so terrible, and that our babe may grow up without my knowing her and without her knowing me. It is difficult to face. And I know your life without me would be a dull blank. Yet you must never let it become wholly so. For to you will be left the greatest charge in all the world, the upbringing of our baby. God bless that child. She is the hope of life to me. It may well be that you will only have to read these lines as one of passing interest. On the other hand, they may well be my last message to you. If they are, know through all your life that I loved you and baby with all my heart and soul, that you two sweet things were just all the world to me. I pray God I may do my duty, for I know, whatever that may entail, you would not have it otherwise. End quote. So if, if that doesn't make you feel something uh, about this battle and about this war and about the people who fought through it, I don't know what does. And here's historian Peter Hart 
Um, and I'll just let him close out the episode here talking about that letter. Quote, Charles May, the loving husband of Bessie May and father to his baby Pauline, would indeed be killed the next day. He is buried in the Danzig Alley British Cemetery. Small-scale tragedies litter the history of war. Sad reminders that the necessities of war ruin the lives of millions. If you like this episode of the podcast or any of the previous episodes, you can leave a rating or review on whatever platform you're listening to it on. I'm told this helps spread the podcast to people who might be interested in listening to it somehow. So that would be fantastic if you could do that. If you didn't like the episode, you can leave me an angry tweet and we can talk about why it was terrible. Ultimately, I'm just glad you're out there listening. So that being said, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.